There's a cat over here. There's a cat over there. And the wrong one died. And the wrong one died. Welcome to The Wrong Cat Died, the podcast breakdown of the cat's catastrophe. I'm your host, Mike Abrams, and today we have another special guest. She starred as Victoria in the 2016 Broadway revival of Cats. Welcome, Georgina Peskogin, and thank you for joining us. Hi, so, thanks so much for having me, Mike. So I do want to kick things off because I almost always ask everyone their history with cats, but you had, before you got asked to audition, you've had a very long ballet career. And so I want to ask kind of a, what made you decide to say, yeah, I'll go out for cats. Like I'll take on that audition. <laughs> um, that is a very long story. I will try to make it succinct. How, um, so I am a soloist with New York city ballet. I had been um, performing there, had recently gotten promoted in 2013 and sort of, it, like at, at a certain point in a large institutional ballet company, you get kind of like categorized and placed in these like boxes of what sort of roles you were due. So I was like coming up against a lot of um, like barriers or ceilings, if you will. Like it, it's, it, it's, I am the first Asian American woman to ever be promoted out of the core of New York city ballet in its 70 year existence. Wow. So that gives you an idea of the kind of people are used to seeing blonde hair, blue eyed ballerinas and this Eurocentric idea. And they're not really used to seeing like the sugar plum fairy be this. <laughs> um, so I, in that frustration, I guess like flat out frustration, I was seeking other ways to feed this artistry that I had, which I sort of started to moonlight on Broadway. Um, I <laughs> casual. Casual moonlight on Broadway. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, this sounds super privileged, but I, I have, I've been taking a lot of theater classes. I've always been one to keep educating myself in dance, and the, my first foray was um, Josh Burgos. Um, Josh called me. He had choreographed on the town, and then John Rando, who was directing it, called me, and I just happened to like make this decision one summer layoff that I was going to go take tap classes again. <laughs> so I bought tap <laughs> shoes and I get a call from John Rando being like, Hey, do you want to make your Broadway debut? Like, like, but like tomorrow. And I'm like, tomorrow. I, I, sh sure. <laughs> I mean, like I'm on a layoff with New York city ballet. This is like, I'm a free agent at this point. I was like, yeah. So like uh, what happened is that, uh, unfortunately an ensemble dancer, um, broke her toe. So I went in and learned the track and Josh knew that I'm a New York city ballet dancer. And what's kind of rare about our breed is that we learn choreography really fast. So I learned what, the entire so show. One day. I learned her entire track in a day plus Ivy Smith's track, which is the title, um, the, the lead role. And I had no idea what they were thinking. So they were going to have me cover Ivy and I was going to do, so I had fun, like two weeks stint on Broadway. And then I like left it. And then I came back and, and did my summer season at Saratoga Springs with New York City Valley, got a call again. Hey, you know, my colleague is leaving Ivy Smith the role. We have an interim. Would you be willing to come in and play Ivy Smith for two weeks? And so, like, that's how – then I just caught the Broadway bug. I mean, like, just being in that environment with these people and having people surround you without this, like – the competitiveness in the ballet world is so intense. And that's not to say that competition isn't there in a Broadway world. Um, but it was such a, it was such a different and wonderful experience. So that's when I was approached to be like, would you ever be interested in auditioning for cats? I was like, ah, oh, well, I'm flattered, but what cat would I be? Cause I'm like, I'm not, a Victoria. <laughs> I mean, you've been talking to me for like the past 10 minutes and I'm like the antithesis of what Victoria the white cat is. And I just wasn't sure. So I was like, sure. They're like, just come do this audition. Come meet Andy. It was for a different project. I had a blast in the audition and got kind of, you know, told like, Hey, you, you should do this. You should. And he kind of saw a different side of me. So he gave me a chance to be soft and feminine, which is something I'm not usually afforded to be 
at the ballet, believe it or not. Like I play very feminine, strong characters at the ballet. And so you at least had a preconceived notion of what Victoria was supposed to be. So when was the first time you were exposed to the musical pre-audition? The VHS tape. (laughs) And I, right here in Altoona, Pennsylvania, where I sit right now, after uh, Catholic school, I would come home at around 2.30 and my first ballet class would start like 4.30. And so I would watch Cats and alternate between Cats and or Lord of the Dance. So just I'm, those an, two. I'm the ultimate nerd. Yeah, just those two, just really obsessed about Celtic, Irish dancing and Cats. And so when you watch, how many times have you seen that, that VHS? Like a lot. Did you ever burn through an entire VHS? Like, do you have a second one? No, no, okay. I just have not those. That, not that level, but close probably. No, yeah, I mean, it's just, I wasn't like rewinding and, and going back and it just was like, I just thought it was really bizarre. I mean, I also was the kid that sat there and watched Bob Ross and thought that that was the most <laughs> thrilling TV of all time. <laughs> so Bob Ross, Cats, and Irish Dancing. Yeah, this is that why is, I'm single. Yeah. This is, <laughs> <laughs> that is quite a trio for, you said, high school age. Uh, yeah, like ninth grade. Sad, sad, Gina. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So you, so you knew already you had, you had seen the VHS plenty of times. So you knew. And so you said, Hey, I'm probably not the typical Victoria. Did you, who would you say you would have like thought, okay, that's who they want me for? Well, I mean, I, she's the ballerina cat. So, and I only had this one person's like portrayal in my mind and like, I just wasn't, she, she, she played this role as such like, um, there, there was an innocence there, but it almost an innocence in a, like a fragile sort of way, which is like, and my whole approach to it was like, have you seen kittens? They're fucking crazy. They like bounce off the ceiling. <laughs> like, so I kind of infused it with my energy and i think it i think i found an it, it worked for me apparently it worked for trevor nunn and andy blankenbuehler too and i do have to give some credit here that i was working with a company called american dance machine for the 21st century and nikki atkins wanted me to do an excerpt which was the white cat solo like out of context which that's really weird i know you want to talk to me <laughs> about that dance yeah but it's really weird out of context. So like they were doing like Turkey Lurkey, which it's really you, weird in context. Yeah. So they like imagine like me, like rolling onto the floor and like doing this solo completely out of the blue in a, in a montage of like highlights from Broadway's best dance. With no cats behind food. you, nothing. With no cats, just, not even dressed like a cat. Just, it's, just the dance number. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but what was the super, super wonderful bonus out of that is I met and worked with Dame Jillian Lynn, who was the original choreographer and got to learn how special her white cat was to her and how much she had perseverated over choreographing that specific, um, it's only like what, 64 counts possibly of music. It's, it's quite short, that little solo but how important it was to her and uh, the touching interaction between her and her husband where her husband finally was like, you know, Jilly, it's time, you know, like it was like a week before the show opened. She's like, you have to, it's time to put the white cat, bring her to life. So that was a really special sort of like head start into the whole process and creating who Victoria is for me. So what else were you told to help create that Victoria? And then who is Victoria for you? Like what's, what backstory were you given? Um, so my three secret words, so Trevor Nunn and like, yeah. are you, are you've heard from other I've people heard on the from podcast. Other people about the three secret words. Yeah. And then also like the craziness of what we were like, just crawled around on our knees. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine my like delight from like going from, ballet class where it's like super strict to like having to put on knee pads and now they're just like crawl around <laughs> in, in in a short period you didn't have that much time to kind of prep for no, this role they were you know they did the casting and then we got into a room we did this whole circle where they introduced everyone and they were like okay hey, everybody on the floor yeah. and i was like this is a wild <laughs> 
Yeah, it's a different. I mean, it sounds like a very different experience in general. Um, and it was just one of those for, things. Yeah. yeah, you just had to jump off the cliff or just get left behind in this. Like, like. Um, so my words were innocent, romantic, and unapologetic. Ooh, unapo- and, I wouldn't have expected that last one. Yeah, and I really kind of um, grabbed onto the unapologetic one. So you, okay. So those are your three words. Did you, what kind of backstory did you come up with? Cause I've heard from some of your other cast members that they had very intricate kind of thoughts about who their cat was going in. Mm. Did you have that or, or did you kind of stick to your, your words? Well, I wanted to, I knew, especially for, the solo that Jillian, you know, Andy was very forthright in saying that like he hadn't, like he wanted to honor Jill. Like Jilly was like, you can't touch white cat solo. You can Mm. mess around with whatever else you need to, um, and improve upon or, you know, like cut what, you know, do what you do you Andy. Like, um, I think they had a very like symbiotic relationship in that. Um, and they they understood each other in the mutual respect of the choreography there. Yeah. Um, but my backstory, you know, she's a young cat. I kind of, the, it depended on the show. Sometimes I played her like a little bit of a ditz to, until the second act. And then sometimes she would just be this wild feral thing, like keeping in mind this like crazy idea how I've seen my friends kittens just like go ape shit on an apartment. Oh yeah. And so I have that uh, capability in my performance quality. Like I dance much bigger than my actual body frame. Um, So I kind of cued into that in the bigger dance uh, sequences. So like my backstory, she was pretty young. So there's not, there's not, a lot I can say, like, I'm new to this whole, this is my first Jellicle ball, first time being invite, invited. And, you know, I've got like my young friends, but I'm also like, it, like, you know, like Tyler Haynes and I were very close friends at the time. So it's just like Tiger and Victoria don't really have a thing, but we made it a thing. <laughs> so like yeah, Victoria you- could also was like scrappy enough to like hang with the, like the more adult cats too. But she kind of like respected the boundary. I'm you starting know, like, to think Tyler's friendships with actual actors are the reasons that there are a lot of cats rumor mill like from that production, because I think he had relationships with so many people <laughs> from the cast that you could see it or feel it on stage, and it was like a little maybe different than what they were expecting. But it's it's we talked about it when I interviewed him um, because there was a couple where everyone's like, I don't know, they might hate each other, and he's like, No, we just had fun with that, you know? Like, um, okay. <laughs> Oh, yeah, ahead. so that's the backstory. And I also like had a collar. So I imagine that I did have an owner and that I, you know, like I wasn't one of the, you know, the wild cats of the junkyard. So Yeah, the rumor is your owner is the landlord. Of the junkyard. Yes. Of the I th- I think the house that Mungo Jerry and Rebel Tees are technically stealing from. Wow. Okay. Possibly. So let's talk about your dance numbers because you have two kind of major dance numbers. The one is the one you've, you know, you've already talked about, which is the solo. Mm -hmm. Um, I know I was mes I know nothing about dance, about ballet, about in general. I know nothing about singing. Um, I was mesmerized when I saw it because I just, I had no idea what I was going to go see. And that particular number sticks out because it's just like, it's everything stops around it. And it's just like the main focus. And it was, it was beautiful and like really, really cool and just such a cool thing to see then i started reading kind of the backstory behind it and it's like there's a lot of rumors of how that is actually the interpretation of that how would you describe the your solo dance number is it your oh it was definitely coming of age it's a coming of age but also like because of time constraints and i was like doing this american dance machine project like off company hours i was meeting dame jillian lynn at like 8 30 in the morning and she would come in she's like okay this has to be from the nipples and i'm like <laughs> like i haven't even had a sip of coffee yet what's going on and she it is fully sensual i wouldn't say like sexual 
but it is sensual. Like this cat is starting to come into her own body and feel this like immense feline power. And I think it's also very much a feminist story. Um, and I think, I think cats in general and this whole late edition of Grizabella being the heroine, it, it, it's all a, a super feminist story. And I can, I can elaborate upon that, but like, there's no is and but you read right. Like it's a very sensual solo. It's her, like she would say like when I, she wanted like the split to be very slow. And just as I like hit the ground, she wanted this like reverberation through my body. And she would literally be like, it's like an orgasm, Gina. And I was like, it is not a clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> that had to be quite an experience to go through, especially at that time, the morning that time with the original, you know, just with who it was too, just such a unique experience. But she was so warm and loving and the way, and, it, and she was a ballet dancer. I mean, I, it's, I'm trying to explain a lot of the, like ballet dancers are so in tune with their bodies anyway. So it didn't really shock me for her to be like, I need you to feel this from like your root chakra. Like that's something I'm used to. It's, it's not faked or like it's, you really have to be in it um, in the sense of like theater. There's no film. There's like no magic of film happening here. Mm-hmm. And, and it was also just wild that this, like she, how old was she there? She must've been like 89 she and like didn't have her hip replacement yet and she could do the solo better than I like she did the <laughs> coccyx the coccyx balance which is like the tail balance where like the two legs are up at the end of the solo that was so hard for me and she was like boop and she's just like, ran what? away what's your problem <laughs> yeah. wow she was incredible she is just a wonder a god rest her soul um she's the most wonderful person so your first the solo is very sensual the second dance is very sexual and yeah I, I would say that's more sexual it's, it's basically a mating dance is what it reads mm-hmm. as and it's with was it with plato in your production yes okay because i i also am basing almost all of my knowledge from the vhs which is what's on youtube and so every time I'm like, oh, what happened in 2016, which is the only production I've seen live. I saw it twice in 2016, um, but I don't, you know, I'm sitting here. Did going, you I don't even remember. get to see me before I had yeah. to leave? Yeah, oh, okay. I saw I saw the second to last preview. Oh, ooh, you saw the fun stuff. <laughs> I saw, yeah, I saw the, um, that was, my story was, is I had a friend that uh, grabbed tickets um, who works in Broadway who said, let's go see it. Like, this is the very i just moved to new york like this is the the show you got to see that's very kind of traditional broadway um and then she got super sick and couldn't go and so i went by myself during a matinee on a saturday and i had no idea what i was seeing um and was just like mesmerized um and so yeah that is the very first one that i saw it about a year later so i think you were both of them in both of them oh wow mike i kind of love that story it's your first cat's experience yeah it was matinee no one told me that i should have had like a lot more to drink before mm-hmm. I got there. Mm-hmm. Um, I was not warned of that, but, uh, but yes. Okay. So the second one is definitely a mating dance. You're um, virtually. Yeah. yeah. It's this because what now I'm forgetting what it was called. And when we like Jillian Lynn had worked with us for a while and actually Chris Gurr writes about this. Um, well, he wrote about it and then he did it in his podcast, in his own podcast. I don't know if he listened to it. Um, another cat's diary he describes mm-hmm. how like jilly lynn jilly and lynn came in and like made us get all in the um the orgy clump and it's called yeah. an orgy clump i believe in the notes i i mean my my facts could be wrong but i'm pretty sure that it says orgy clump in the musical score and or the like the books the, the notes yeah, okay the notes so it's like it we're all overtaken by this like power of the jellical moon this like magic and so yeah it's it's about sex and so like i'm the one that's just found myself in the solo like tapped into my like ineffable namesake um and then plato who was played by daniel gaiman um what a wonderful partnership that was i have never trusted somebody so much and he had 
he tossed me all over that stage. <laughs> and it was just trust from, from day one. And to have that sort of like intimate of an interaction every night dressed as cats seems wild, but it was also just like a very special, a special thing to have. Mm-hmm. And I felt super safe. Um, and it was fun to get into that, like the whole, you know, like those like first dates where you like want to kiss someone and you don't like kind of like feeling that again every night is refreshing and kind of revives your soul from doing the same thing, you know, over yeah, and over, over again. And over again. So th- one of the things I've argued is that I don't think this show is for children. And the fact that in the notes it says an orgy clump, I think well, I mean, like, might prove that. But do you think that, like, I mean, I guess you watched it as a ninth grader, but do you think if you, you know, you, you want to bring a seven or eight year old to the the theater to see cats? Uh, my my like little nieces and nephews came, and so I think that's a little different because you're in it. Like, you know, it's it's different to go see someone they know, but like, what if but they like didn't even care? Like Gabe, he was all about. Um, I think it's Natasha Katz that did the lighting. He was all about the lighting. I mean, the lighting was super trippy. Like he cued in on like a totally different aspect of the show. He could care, he's like, oh yeah, it's my, it's my aunt. Uh. Like, yeah. <laughs> I don't think he picked up on the sexual nature of it. Okay. That I seems it depend- fair. I think it's, it's all yeah. like. I just, I was. I mean, there's a the lot of distraction. F- oh, I mean, the stage itself, like that was the first thing I noticed is that the stage is incredible um but i also was the third seat in and was not prepared for green eyes um and it scared the living daylights out of me as an adult and so i just Mm -hmm. kept thinking there's no way like there's no way and then you start to see all this very sexual stuff and then i started kind of listening i'm like some of these lyrics are a little aggressive um you know it's probably all going over the kid's head but there are kids everywhere I mean, the T.S. Eliot poems are like kind of dark. Like Grizabella's. Grizabella's not in the book because it was too dark for children was the reason yeah. it was left out of the book. Like there's some really deep, dark themes. But I think I think it's important for children to to. I mean, listen, if it gets them and they start to love dance. I mean, there's there was one little boy, little boy. And it was right when I was leaving the show and he had waited for like an hour. I had no idea. I was just decompressing after two and a half hour show. Mm -hmm. And then finally someone calls me down and he was sobbing. I mean, he did not pick up on any of like the weird sexual like tensions or anything. He just was taking, he was like, I have never seen anyone dance so beautifully before. Like this kid literally went home and asked his mom to start him in dance classes. That's incredible. I think for that reason, take your kids to the theater. And like, there would be a disclaimer. Perhaps there might be like, I hear you, Mike, like maybe a disclaimer be like, there's some like sensual like situations, but like what's different than like what they see on TV nowadays anyway. That's fair. I mean, that's, but that's a different argument. Right. (laughs) I I know. know, That's that's what's, what's worse. Um, No. And I agree to bring kids to theater because like, being able to see especially musicals you know you get to see kind of the singing the dancing and all the numbers that go with it that was the as i you know poked fun at cats the storyline the other half of that is that it's as someone who can't dance and can't sing it's like oh the this this takes some serious skill to be able to perform this especially when you're doing both at the same time you know like some of those songs like you see on broadway in general has a lot of singing and dancing together and it's like cats is just like non-stop where you're really in it. So I was very impressed, but I also was a little, tri- you know, I was a little trippy. And so I kind of walked out being like, Oh, that was like, again, impressive, but also what did I just witness? Yeah, that seems about right. And I want to thank you so much for appreciating how much work went into that. Like uh, the singing and the dancing combined and in like dealing with like the rake to metal stage and not being on a flat surface and, and just crawling around like a cat like it it we I would say like cats is a lifestyle <laughs> like, and virtually nothing like you're in basically oh, yeah. a, a onesie and that's the other thing about like my character development 
during the previews, you know, there was like this whole discussion about like how people were seeing like my undergarments through my white unitard. And I was like, because you can't wear white undergarments under a white unitard. It's just going to come out like more opaque, like it has to be skin tone. And then we like got into the whole discussion, like you have to match my skin tone. Otherwise you're still going to see the, <laughs> the underwear. <laughs> and then, um, and then, yeah, like it, as the white cat, I couldn't hide at all. Even the numbers that I wasn't dancing, I just like showed up as this little blue thing, this little thing and yeah. lit in the corner, even I was trying to hide. So like those were the moments where I would like look to Tyler and we would play, you know, just start messing around with each other when I was in the corner. And people would always inevitably see that because I'd forget like you are a beacon of light literally on yeah. the stage well especially after your first number two it's like you were the center and then you can see you everywhere so it's um i do want to ask about the kind of catch rumor mill and see if you can either yeah, let, validate yeah. agree disagree so one of the rumors which i think you might might not be totally true because i think you sing you sing in the show too correct yeah i, sing. Sing? I don't yeah. have like a solo i originally syllabub and victoria or Gemma and Victoria were the same cat. And then in, in the original production, there wasn't a ballet dancer that could do the Victoria track and then also sing the very high pitched. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the rumors is, is that Victoria is a deaf or mute cat. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's so clearly not, disagree. that wasn't my storyline, but how okay. interesting, how interesting. And then the other one we talked about was that you're the landlord's cat and it's because of the collar and the fact that your fur is like very clean and white and um, more indoor cat than some of the other characters. I mean, I would say that I definitely have an owner. Am I the owner of the house that Mungo Jerry and Rumpatees are stealing things out of? That's might maybe stretching it. I don't know. I well, feel there's like no, there's the, you can stretch a lot in this, which we're, we're going to get to next. Okay. So, Family tree. It's plausible. Family, okay, family tree. tree. There's zero. It's a lot of dotted lines. Um, so one rumor is, is that you're Grisabella's daughter. Oh. Because you're the first one to welcome her back at the end. Um, and probably just age in general as being one of the younger kittens. And she's one of the older cats. So do you think that that has any merit? Yeah, I think there's there's merit to that. I didn't see it that way in, in the way I portrayed it. Um, I thought she is like a, a meant she is like a vision of what like I think Victoria and Grisabella were um their kindred spirits. Because uh, I yeah. think that makes you sense. know Grisabella was a Victoria. Like she had an mm -hmm. owner. She had a something and that all went by the wayside. So that's why Grisabella kinda they their arc is um, they're tethered together in their storylines. Do you think Victoria followed Grisabella's path down the dark path? Or do you think she stayed pure? More pure. Well, you know, I don't didn't leave the tribe. Listen, that girl's not Victoria was the pure not after pure. the jellical ball. Yeah, that's true. She, Very true. She, uh, she stayed she she stayed in the jellical tribe, did not leave to go rumored to be a cat prostitute that's what the rumor is for grisabella um, when she leaves Drugs i don't think victoria went that route i think victoria is kind of like a deeper she's a a deeper empathetic feline of that tribe i think she initially like her reaction to grisabella like she's just thought like she is so finding who she is and i think she just kind of breaks away from the groups and, and is like nah i think I think this, I think this chick is fine. Like, let's give her a shot. Let's not be total dicks. Um, okay, so it's not mom. It's a little bit of like, this could be my future. Let's, let's yeah, welcome her I back. Think, yeah, I think it's like, what would I feel like if I had, a, I'd had, I would want them to see, I think she sees a bet, like a good in Grisabella. I think she sees, um, a potential i think she sees that i think she sees a softer side in a lot of the cats actually like mm -hmm. so the other rumor is that your monkish traps and demeter's daughter i see i would believe that more okay so that one seems more plausible 
Yeah, I would believe that more. Why does that one seem more Because Monkey than... Strap is totally a dad to Victoria. Like, totally a dad. Okay. So that one seems, that one has more merit. The other one is that there's the obvious love interest with Plato. But mm-hmm. the other one is that you might have a love interest with Mr. Mistopheles. Oh, I thought the rumor was that Mr. Mistopheles and Tugger had a love interest. Well, I mean, that <laughs> one's definitely the case. Um, but there is there is a Victoria, um, Mr. Mistopheles rumor as well. And yeah. it's either, you know, potential, you know, either lovers or brother, sister. And I think it's because in the VHS production, you see them together a lot during different dances. And you see them kind of uh, interacting a lot during right. different dances. I don't know. I don't know if I, I wouldn't say it was a romantic attraction. I'm going to, I'm going to say like meh to romantic attraction. I think it's more of like a, maybe she's, maybe she's like the budding. (laughs) I was going to say, um, she's like the budding wingman for her, her gay friend, Miss Stoffley's. Yeah. And helping, t- I mean that that kind of works with the fact. She's that like you helping were with procure that like whole tugger that, thing. Like, yeah. Okay. Like, that I, that makes sense. That fits that fits your storyline a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So a couple other character questions. If you were not Victoria, who's mm-hmm. which cat would you want to play? Uh, Bombay Arena. Ooh, another another very great dance number mm-hmm. and song. I mean, Christine Cornish Smith slayed it. I would watch her her, and just do her number. I'd be like, I wish I could sing like that and also dance. Like, I, I, I just, I was so humbled by the whole process of being in that company. It, it was really one of the scariest things I've done, but also one of the most gratifying things I've ever done. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she. That's honestly, as I've watched the show, that's become my favorite song. Yeah, it's the one that gets stuck in my head most often now. Um, great. It's just, I just think it's great. <laughs> Who would you want to quarantine with? Which cat would you want to quarantine with? I mean, endless entertainment, Mustafa. <laughs> yeah, I think it was a good choice. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, plus we could dress up together. We both like glittery outfits. Like, I have a rhinestone collar. He has a rhinestone jacket. Like. <laughs> I think we get along great. I do want to ask my the the main question, which mm-hmm. is I've argued at length that Grizabella was not the right character to die at the end of the musical. So um, I actually rated Victoria's incomplete when I did my episode because I did not think that your character was even really up for for it, um, and just did, wouldn't have like. I think that you eventually will win. Like your character in however many years is going to win the Jellicle competition and die to ascend to the outside layer, but not not this one. So, but I don't think it was Grizabella. So, do you agree? And if you want to defend Grizabella, why? And if not, who do you think should have died? I have been pondering this, and I I do think Grizabella was the right choice. Okay. And here, now, here let's hear let's what? hear that let's hear the the <laughs> rationale. So you have you have this this whole idea, and I tried to like when I'm when I was explaining like why people should come to cats and why it's like a great it's it's yes we're cats but yes these are all feelings and personalities that humans have. So in looking at it in that frame, now, um, like minus the fur, what do we normally do to our women once? they become old and no longer beautiful. We sort of discard them as a society. Mm. And so what pained me, what pains me, what pains me on a lot of different levels and in a lot of like my research and backstory for Victoria, it's just like, you know, I have chosen for my profession to be a ballerina and that's a young person's game. Like I am 35 I'm no longer 19, 20, like that. So I physically feel um, just sort of like the decay (laughs) of my, um, I I just feel the body wane a little bit more um, viscerally than, um, than than maybe a normal person would that I don't want to like speak for someone who doesn't dance. I'm sure like we all feel aches and pains at at our age. Um, 
but so that was something and like, I will have to give up this career that I love that I've dedicated my life to. And so like, and how Grizabella is her whole plot is that she didn't do anything wrong. She didn't kill anyone. She's not like a macavity. She was a sex worker. And we don't know the circumstances of why she had to do this, but she managed to survive through that. And, and generally speaking, like, like there's a lot of abuse. Like we emotionally abuse her and like some of the cats actually swipe at her in the show. So like there's abuse to this female cat. And then she, she, she builds up all of this like emotion and she's lamenting the choices that she's made. And she like sings this guttural, like heartbreaking song of like memory of like a youth and a youth lost a beauty lost. And she feels worthless. And that's why every single night I would be sobbing in tears Cause it's just this idea that like, wow. And if, and it happens in real life too. Like we like, look at, look at any woman in Hollywood over the age of 40. Like they, mm-hmm. it's so it's, I do think she was the right cat to, to be picked and to ascend and to be given a chance to maybe relive. And we all, we all make mistakes, but I don't feel like her mistakes were like being a pedophile, you know, I, yeah. I can, uh, so your framing is just very, a very different, like with the way you framed it, I agree with you. I framed it totally different. Well, how did you frame it? I want to understand how you framed it. So I, I've explained this a couple of times on, on this podcast. So I'm sorry give for me, everyone. Give me, give me the, abri- the abridged I, When I went to go see it, I was almost, part of it was like, hey, Leona Lewis is going to be Grizabella which that meant nothing to me. Grizabella, I was like, okay, Leona Lewis is going to sing the one song I knew going into the show. Um, she was on the X factor. Then I saw old Deuteronomy sitting on stage and it felt like a judge. And I just immediately framed it as a singing uh, competition. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so that was my like, and that was why the frame of reference came is because I was like, oh yeah, this is like, and I watched those shows. I enjoy those shows. And so I mean, it was like, oh, they're, they're just competing and it's a show. And it's like, instead of America voting, it's going to be old Deuteronomy. And I've got the person who has who's won or, you know, was successful on one of those shows. But I was like, eh, that was just, I mean, memory is an incredible song and belted out like so well, but I was like, eh, it's the one I was most entertained by and then you start arguing like magic does really well and America's got talent. Like there's a lot of different things. So I framed it totally that way, which is why I'm, you know, everyone who's come on and given very thoughtful and real explanations like, yeah, I mean, that's, that's nice and all, but like, it's not America's got talent. Um, I just take a very kind of humorous, fun poke at it. Um, And that's the way I've made all of my arguments. Yeah, I mean, like, I can I can see it to be like, is it the most? Is she the most flashy character? Nah. Um, so if you are viewing it in that sort of competitive, like, just for sheer like razzle dazzle of like mm-hmm. the theater, yeah, then no, she wouldn't. But in terms of like, what's that? And that's what's great about musical theater is that you have like these numbers that can kind of like these musical numbers help bring the plot along. And we all know that the plot of cats is like, it's loose. It's <laughs> like, loose. It's so loose. And that's what I love hearing about everyone's different. Like, a, like it, it can be whatever the hell you want it to be. I just happen to like, you know, like Victoria, like I don't get to have like a fun, I don't get to be like an asshole cat, like Tugger. Like, yeah. <laughs> like so like I had to frame it like in my work in a way that made her seem very um, honest and very just, just real. And what is this connection? Like what would actually would make her, she doesn't know this cat and like, she's not my mom. I didn't think she was my mom. Um, So like what would make me feel so compelled to comfort her? So not, not the competition thing. Cause otherwise you'd be rooting against her. Yeah, totally. Because you would be, you were in it. You know, you had, you had your dance number. Yeah. You had, you had, a, you had a chance. In my frame. Yeah. Well, thanks, thanks for thinking I had a chance. I didn't even think I had a chance. Yeah, I mean, I think the more you kind of really dig in, your character doesn't. But the biggest, the biggest group out there is Team Gus. 
Oh, to yeah, but I I also agree with like girl like Gus like Gus like lived his like nine lives. He's like yeah. cool. That he's he's done. Yeah, he's he, like it's hard. It's yeah. hard. And then you have people like Victoria running around, and they're like, no. <laughs> yeah, that's Tugger too. Yeah. But Tugger's was again a wildly entertaining performance. Oh yeah. Like that was probably one of my favorite numbers to dance. I love the the Rum Tum Tugger, what Andy did with Rum Tum Tugger, and I also loved I how do you not love McCavity? But um and I loved the fight scene too. That was super fun. Oh, uh, I really wish you would have seen like when one of like the malfunctions happened in the show. Like there was one time when the boot didn't drop and then like uh the stage manager Ira had to come over the god mic and be like he didn't even say Victoria. He was like, Georgina, stop. <laughs> and I was just like, Meh, like just about to start to sell it. He was like, please back up to the tire. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> it was like full on show. And I sat down and I was like, am I a cat? Am I a human? Am I a cat? <laughs> it's wow. so crazy. Yeah. Uh, and then you also missed the time where I was swung out of the show and the tugger picture. Like, I think that's, a super fun thing about our show, the actual picture that they took. They took, yeah. I broke ranks and stripped down in the audience to a leotard and tights and point shoes, which the poor person sitting next to me was probably like, what is this chick doing? <laughs> and I remember like Tyler Haynes knew, but no one else in the cast knew. And I totally punked the whole cast and they were all gagging like they could like the booth singers had to like, i feel like they had to pick up because most of the people on stage were dying laughing because like there's all of a sudden this like ballerina comes traipsing down the aisle and it's like tugger and he disappears yeah. back. <laughs> your production i have I've, I've talked to a good amount of your cast and it's everyone's been so fun and has had like seems like it was a blast to do um, so it was, and it, I feel like you see that on stage, like you could see the, the relationships and the friendships and everything too. Um, when you see it, it didn't not make me le- any less confused, but oh, of at least, you know, you at least get to, to kind of feel that. Well, I mean, that's testament, that's testament to the casting process and to where we've been casting and, and Andy and Dane Jillian Lynn and, and the creative team that was there, like they, they put great, I think, because they knew how hard it was going to be and how intense the effort was needed, that they needed everyone to at least the first, you know, the, the opening Broadway cast to like really gel and mm-hmm. really, I mean, has anyone talked to you about how we all lined up and found like where we were in our alpha beta, like alpha no. omega? That was one of the first things Trevor Nunn did or the first things that I remember. He was like, OK, everyone line up. And just like naturally, like more alpha people in life will go towards the front of the line. And so like, that's how we all, and he's like, do you see that? And we're like, huh. And like, normally I would put, I would put Victoria like at the back of the line, but because I'm me, I was more like not the front front, but like towards the front. So then it was like, that's also something that like infused Oliver. It was just wild like we don't get to do stuff like that in the ballet world and it just (laughs) i've taken all this information and applied it to the things that i do now there but would you uh, do another broadway show what would be your top choice if you could do any show ever any show ever i want to i think i think i am such a specific specialty (laughs) that i think a role i would have to create a role i would i i that's where i feel most comfortable because i i'm not i'm not a straight theater person and you know i feel like i'm not singing isn't where i live like you hear sarah jean ford sing and you're just like this is your gift (laughs) this is is (laughs) your gift and as as you hear q sing um my gift is something different, but the, but I also feel like I have this wonderful, uh, I like storytelling through speech. Like I, I like acting in that sense. Mm-hmm. So I think a blending of those things is something that I'm really looking forward to creating as like my career goes on. Like, I think that's where the catalyst of my max potential mm-hmm. to, to create something special. Mm-hmm. 
So tell us how can we find you on social media? Because that's the important question. Okay. Well, you can find me at Georgina underscore Pascogan um, uh, on the Insta. On the tweet, on the tweets, it's G Pascogan. And I am the rogue ballerina. So you can also just use that hashtag. Um, and yeah, I'm around. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on this podcast today and answering all of my ridiculous questions. They're not um, really and ridiculous. Telling, and telling your thoughtful, serious answer uh, <laughs> for and defense of Grisabella. Um, I, I love hearing all the, you know, the people who have actually really dug in beyond my ridiculous version. I mean, everything is valid in this crazy world we live in. So thank you for listening to this bonus episode with Georgina Pascogan on The Wrong Cat Died, the podcast breakdown of the cat's catastrophe. To follow along, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or anywhere else you listen to podcasts. Follow us on Twitter or Instagram at The Wrong Cat Died, or check us out on our website, thewrongcatdied.com. 